All right, good afternoon, my people. Thank you for spending the either the first Friday of your semester, the second Friday of the semester, or two Fridays to go from your semester. Wherever you may be, whatever you might be doing, we appreciate that you're here spending your Friday with us. My name is Victor Davila. I am on the AIGA DEC steering committee. On behalf of the rest of the team, I'd like to welcome you to our August, almost as September, I forgot what month we're in, our August uh, virtual event. Um, the DEC is uh, the Design Educators Community, um, where we try to have events and support and just overall kind of like cool things to do, a cool community where any design educator is welcomed, whether you are higher education or K through 12, or just uh, working on an, in another organization that's supporting the design community as an educator, you are welcome here. I love to see so many of you uh, because this is a great turnout for this event. And I think it's because it's gonna be a great event. It's one that I've been looking forward to for a long time. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and start it off so that we can get as much time with the speakers as possible. Uh, today we have three amazing educators that are going to share their time and knowledge and insight with us with a specific kind of topic which is a unique topic about ungrading or different grading methods so without further ado i'd like to ask the um the speakers to introduce themselves and we'll go ahead and start with uh, teresa moses teresa take it away of course you start with me <laughs> um i'm like trying to pull up a bio okay <laughs> So hello, everyone. My name is Teresa Moses. Um, I also go by Terry if rolling your R's is not your thing. Um, I am an assistant professor of graphic design and the director of design justice for the College of Design at the University of Minnesota um, here in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, my work is centered in um, activism, organizing, abolition, Black liberation, and anti-racism. And I try and incorporate as much as I can of that into my classroom. I also am the creative director and co-founder of a design studio called Blackbird Revolt, uh, in which we um, try to, you know, engage our community through um, abolitionist-based uh, design approaches. So thanks. I will uh, pass it over to Ryan. All right. I knew you would have a great intro. So now I feel like I got to step up with, with another good intro. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Ryan Coe. I am an associate professor of integrated media arts at Juniata College, which is a small liberal arts college in central Pennsylvania. Um, I oversee the integrated media arts program and teach courses from 100 to 400 level, um, all undergraduate students. And we do a lot of community engaged learning, um, civic engagement and projects that we work with local and national clients. Um, the other thing I should probably mention, I recently received tenure and a very big part of my research and my tenure materials was how important alternative assessment has been to my curriculum in my classroom setting. All right, Christian, you're up. <laughs> All right. How's it going, everyone? I'm Christian Dunn. Um, I am an associate graphic design professor at Jacksonville State University in Alabama, not Florida. I'll make that clear. Um, and I teach undergrad to grad um, anything that's not um, web based or anything like that, mostly print, um, screen printing, that kind of stuff, um, mostly into from a personal side, murals, um, screen printing, apparel, and um, brand brand design logos and that kind of stuff. So, yep. Awesome, thank you, Christian. Thank you all. So in the spirit of introducing ourselves, I forgot to mention um, if you are a DEC member and if you can go ahead and add uh, just a reaction to let us know that you are a DEC member, this is a DEC committee that is present. Uh, here we go. And um, also, there's a lot of people joining us from a lot of different places around the world. So if you can go ahead and introduce yourself and let us know where you're joining us from in the chat, I would appreciate it. I am particularly uh, joining you from Orlando, Florida. I teach at the University of Central Florida, but I know we're coming from around the country and around the world. So please go ahead and let us know 
where you're joining us and possibly where you teach as well, because maybe we're close to each other and we kind of have a copy at some point soon. That'd be awesome. So um, I'll go ahead and start the first question. And I'd like this to be a fluid conversation. And if you have a question at some point, go ahead and raise your hand and we'll acknowledge you and, um, and we'll go ahead and take it from there. But I'll go ahead and start with Christian first, because this whole idea for this event happened while uh, Christian and I met at a conference at Creative South in Columbus, Georgia, a couple of years ago, a few years ago now. And Christian started telling me about this whole concept of what we called at the time spec grading. And it was a brand new concept to me. I'd never heard of it, but I was intrigued by how uh, Christian was explaining it to me and what he was saying. So Christian, if you can go ahead and, and kind of explain a little bit about what you were telling me and how you apply it to your own classes. Yeah, so it's back grading um, from the, the book by Linda B. Nilsson. Um, isn't necessarily geared toward the arts and that was kind of a hard thing um, but i really like this concept of um, specifications grading right and we like this idea I like i want my students i want to be able to grade my students pass or fail right so immediately when i heard this it was very similar um, and so the way that i do this try and quickly um, i usually will break my classes down into two or three units and then within a unit um, i have d C, B, and A levels. And then within those levels, there is any number of criteria. And the way that my students get those level grades is that they have to start with level D and they have to complete to perfection each criteria in that level. And so once they have passed all of the level D, congratulations, you have a D on this project. Now you have the choice to go to level C. And then they can finish level C stuff, go on to B and A. And the thing that I like the best about this is that it, it gives the student the choice of what grade they want to get. So no longer is it, you know, in my hands as far as like giving them points that we all know don't really matter um, in the long game. Um, and, and it's a lot, it, it gives the student the responsibility um, of of their own grade it's in their hands um and so that's kind of that's a very simple way of talking about spec grading so i don't know if you want more questions about it but um that that the main thing is is that there are criteria that the students have to pass but they get to choose which ones you know what grades they want um yeah so i don't know if that other questions from there it does i do have a follow-up question and how has the the um, reception from the students been to that kind of grading as opposed to something that they've been used to for so long yeah. yeah so in the beginning you know because the criteria everything has to be laid out like very clear from the very beginning so that they have complete control so it's a ton of work on the upfront on my part but um, once the student when we start the class like i give them all of the uh, everything they need for unit one um, and it's a ton of it's a, it's a ton of information, um, which most of the time they're very overwhelmed with. Um, I, one of my favorite quotes from a student um, after I kind of explained this new system and how we were doing it, and then here's the first unit and all this, she she said, "I think I'm going to throw up." Right. Um, and then at the end of the semester, like and and even when she knew this, I knew she was gonna love this system. And at the end of the semester, she was like, "Yes, like I love this. It, everything was clear. Um, I don't, I didn't, I wasn't trying to guess what kind of grade you would give me." Um, and so, for the most part, obviously there are pros and cons to all the different kinds of gradings and all that kind of stuff. But the um, as long as as long as they're you know good students. Um, they, I mean, they, they, they take to it well, because once, especially once I give it to them, um, and they realize like I'm making the decision to not make a C or a B or an A or whatever it is, um, they felt like they had control of their grades, which tends to be something that like, I, you know, I might get the grade that I just turned this project in. Um, sometimes I don't see that grade until finals, right? Even though it was project one. Um, you know, we hear that a lot, um, but for this, once they got into it and they, they learned the system, 
then it became a lot more comfortable because um, they had that control. So then other things that some teachers might apply into their grading, such as attendance or things that are kind of like not particular to specific projects, is are those things that aren't included? I mean, could me as a student who just wants to D turn in D work and then peace out for the rest of the semester after X amount of weeks? Or how does that part work? Yeah, yeah, no. And that's another thing that I love about the system is that, um, you know, normally our school, we have um, a three attendance policy. Um, you can miss three classes. And then after that, it's a letter grade dropped for each, you know, missed class. Um, when I do this system in a class, I tell them I don't care about the attendance. Um, and I give them, you know, like you should, you know, there, there are deadlines. So you should have D and C done by a certain point within this unit um, and then B and A, right? If they complete D or C and then they turn in their work um, and they're like, yeah, I'm cool with a C or even a D, then I tell them, hey, we will start the second unit on this date. I'll see you then, right? Because if, if they don't want to be there, then that's fine. They're adults. They're the ones paying for this. Like the kids who want to be here, I want to be able to give them all of my attention and Right? I tell my students all the time, like you put in the hard work and like I will put in that work for you, too. Right. Um, I will go above and beyond for you if that's what you're doing. And so students who, you know, you know, unfortunately, we get a lot of students that they're only here because their parents made them. Right. And it's not they don't actually want to do this. And so um, I don't know, maybe that's that's not right. I haven't kind of figured that out, but that's that's how it works. That's I mean. I know I probably would have been, unfortunately, that student. Um, so it, it makes sense. I find that fascinating. Um, yeah, I have more questions. Um, but uh, for now, I want to move over to Ryan. Ryan, you have something similar yet different from the way that Christian does his grading. I'd like to uh, hear a little bit about what you do and how you apply to your own class. Yeah, so I think one of the important things just to disclose up front, um, I'm at a small institution and I'm the only design educator on campus. So I'm not in a department with other people that do what I do or even in certain capacities understand um, how I approach my curriculum. And so um, an interesting part of why I determined that ungrading in my case was a really important transition from traditional forms of grading was I frequently have students that come in um, who are from the English department and are wanting to take some design and media courses, or they're from IT computer science and they want to understand the front end of design. And so the challenge that I have now overcome has been learning to really think more creatively about the sense of authentic belonging in a design classroom and how students that are coming in that don't have a background in design, um, how can I evaluate them in a transformative way for them that they feel welcome and part of the conversation? And so for me, I it's very different than what um, my co-presenters will probably be sharing, but we start out every semester with a project proposal, every student um, will determine how they want to contribute to the project. Um, we do work a lot with community partners. Most of my classes are considered community engaged learning designated um, on, on the institutional level. Um, and so working on those project proposals, which will later become a project report, um, it's something that they start with and then they continue to contribute to. And so that um, similar to what Christian mentioned, they can kind of decide how much they want to do and how how they want to contribute based on their own interests and goals. Um, I also focus on attendance, deadlines, um, some criteria and rubrics within each of the, the things that they're turning in. Um, and then midterm, we do self-assessment and peer assessment. Um, and then towards the end of the project, we sit down and go through, um, everyone presents their work, we have a formal critique, and then they have several days to go back and make revisions on their project proposals, which are then turned in at the end as a project report. Um, and so I think one other thing, I'm sure many of the people on, on Zoom today with us have 
um, been asked to do time tracking and whether you like it or not, um, it's a good experience for students to learn how to determine where their time went on a project. Um, and so that's something else that's been really helpful, especially for the non-design students to understand how much time it takes. Um, and so in general, the ungrading method for me has been really helpful to still have a high expectation for, for each of the students, but to allow them to determine how they approach their learning based on what they contribute. And I'll ask the same question I asked uh, Christian with you is like how, especially having students from dis different disciplines, what has been the reaction from the students and does one discipline kind of like favorite or is more open to it over the other one? Yeah. So in the last, um, I started doing this during the summer of the pandemic. So summer of 2020, I had a colleague from the English department say, you should really read this book. Um, I think this would be great for what you're doing with the program. And from then until now, overall um, course evaluations, which um, at my institution, you know, our course evaluations are very important. I'm at a teaching institution. And overall, they have been very positive that they feel that they have an understanding of what they're expected to do within the rubric, but then also what they individually are contributing. Um, I have had a few semesters where I've had to reevaluate what I have on the ungrading rubric. And then also, um, you know, based on student um, kind of the mental health side of grading, right? Students want to know where they're at. at every stage of the semester, um, some more than others. Some are willing to engage and participate and wait and see what happens. And others are feeling like they really wanna know from day one where they're at. Um, so I have from the start until now made a lot of adjustments on the rubrics that I use. Um, and so it's been interesting to see what are the areas from the student perspective that they care most about and it's usually the flexibility on if they said they were going to do something and now it's changed, how do we adjust that? And that usually um, is resulted with several reflections or discussions within their project report where they can say, at the beginning, I really wanted um, to fly a kite but now I'm at the end of the semester and not only did I not ever even put the kite together but I ended up doing something totally different and this is why. And so it allows in my experience for much deeper engagement from the student perspective and um, a reflective process for them to explain how they made a pivot mid project. You mentioned a book, is it the same book that Christian was talking about? Um, actually, so I was thinking we, we may share resources at some point, but I use this ungrading book. Um, it's just called Ungrading um, by Susan Bloom. And there's a few others that I've used in research, um, but this has been the one that I, it was kind of at the get go okay. um, that I worked from. If you, if you wouldn't mind, oh, never mind. Natalie's way ahead of me. It's in the chat. <laughs> and Christian's <laughs> book too, if, if y'all wouldn't mind. Yeah. But thank you, Natalie, for being on top of things. Thank you, Ryan. And then yes. um, uh, Teresa, I know that you have a, a totally different yet similar in a lot of ways approach to grading on your side as well. So can you share a little bit about how you come about it? Absolutely. So can we all just first agree that grading is like the worst part of being uh, an educator? Um, I hate it because students assign their own value to grading. And so as someone who does justice, design justice centered work, not only am I looking at ungrading, but how am I like unclassrooming? <laughs> That's a word. Um, I think it's so important, like even we talk about policies like attendance and we talk about things that are traditionally, um, you know, required. Why are those things required? And I think a lot of times we'll, we'll find that those things are required because they're a way of us being able to control the students. 
um, not seeing them for their own humanity. And I think it is really important for us to put the student first. So before I even go into what grading looks like in my classroom, I set a classroom culture. Um, Bell Hooks in Teaching to Transgress, since we're throwing out books, um, she says the classroom remains the most radical space of possibility in the academy. And so if you know that you have the power as a professor to be able to shift your classroom um, in whichever way that you would like to, I think it really starts off with, you know, how we are assessing. Um, one of the first things that students will hear me say as I go over the syllabus is that I don't care about a grade. And I absolutely mean that. Um, and so the way that I go about that is I have um, a grading form and this grading form they fill out. Uh, we go through the process. They have uh, they have assignments every single day. So they come in and they're going to have some piece of homework, whether it's like what's the next iteration of your design or are you turning in sketches, whatever it is. So they have something every day. So they're held accountable to that thing. Um, at the end of each class, I say, hey, is this uh, doable for everybody? And if you agree to it, the classroom agreed to it. That was the culture that we set for the next class. So that again, that that kind of like like shift in responsibility is no longer me just like sort of waving my finger and saying, this is what you have to do. Um, They're all agreeing to that. And so you've all agreed that like you want really good work. Um, so at the end of the project, um, they are turning in their project with a grade form that they fill out, they grade themselves. Um, they grade themselves and then I come in and I say, grade approved and here's why I agree with you. Or I say, grade not approved and here's why I don't agree with you. Um, now, I will say this, even when I say grade not approved and I don't agree with their grade that they gave them, oftentimes I will just give them the grade that they wanted. Um, and that does not happen a lot. I will tell you students grade themselves very, very, very hard. Um, and so I will say that I'm usually like, I don't agree with that grade and I give them like, I give them a bump up. I've only had one instance that I can actually remember where they gave themselves an A and I was like, y'all know this was, this was some BS. Why you turn this in and give yourself an A? Um, and I gave her the A. And what I did was, is I went in on her in, in critique, I just like, girl, this was horrible. Like, you know, it was horrible. Like, you know, but I said it in like the professor way. Um, <laughs> the next semester, I had a class with the same student. She came in the first day and she was like, she was like, hey, I, I like, I know you gave me my, an A for my final project last semester. I just didn't think you would do that. Um, but what you said, that really, I like, I want I revised it and I want to show you, like, can you, can you blah, blah, blah. That's the impact that I want to have. I don't, I don't want to be the hard professor who's like, oh my God, this one's really, really tough. No, I want you to grow. And if that is the point, then a grade is not the point. The grade, the, the point is then for me to see growth every class. And so for me, put that, put that decision into the student's hand. I never get any students coming to me asking me why they got the grade they got. I'm telling you, this, the reason why I started ungrading per se is because I hated that pressure. Like I hate the pressure of students coming and saying, I deserve this. And then they go to so-and-so, dean this and provost that to try and get their grade. Wash my hands of it. I don't want that. What I want is for you all to learn and grow. So even though I gave that student an A, um, I let that student know that when they got into the real world, I would not hire you as someone who owns a design studio because I don't think you put effort and time into your work and into your craft. And you're wasting money, you know, by by staying in the classroom and just like turning in whatever you want. Um, so if that's not the experience you want, cool. That's what I'll expect of you. But you know, she didn't want me to expect that. So she came back with a different attitude and a different mindset. So for me, um, I give them grade forms, they grade themselves. I say yes, or I say no. And um, usually I don't even change the grade and it just makes the classroom so much easier. I just do not want them to value themselves based off of some letter that was built. Uh, this system is built in some colonial imperialist way. I don't, I, I'm a black queer woman. I cannot, that's not me. And so I want to unclassroom the whole thing. And that's, that's how I do it. Awesome, thank you. So as you guys all know, academia sometimes is like really steeped in tradition. So I'm wondering, we ask, uh, I asked you about your students already, but has there been any colleague pushback from once they find out what you're doing and how you're doing it different, especially those that might have a concern uh, with, um, uh, inf uh, inf I forgot the term now, but grade inflation, grade inflation that, that they might not get the grades that they deserve and so on and so forth, or grade deflation in that matter. But what kind of feedback have you gotten from your colleagues? And this is to everybody and you guys can take turns answering if you'd like. We can start with uh, Teresa if you want since you were the most recent speaker. Oh, okay. I, was, <laughs> I thought maybe Sorry. someone was going to respond. <laughs> um, absolutely. I think, uh, and I don't, no one ever says it to my face because, you know, 
I'm a black woman. They don't ever say it to me. But I will say, I think that there is this um, elitism that they just need to get over. And um, there's this idea that like, you know, if someone gets an A and, and they don't deserve it, like, you know, that, that the program is somehow like not doing well. And I think, what is the relationship that y'all are having with your students? Like, I, I don't know. I feel like there there's a deeper rooted issue there that needs to be talked about because if really we're only, we're only valuing our program based on how many Fs we give, out um we want people to know that our program is rough and tough and you have to like make it through this like cheese grater and come out super scarred at the end and like get demeaned and critiques uh, to be a good program uh, i don't want to be a part of that program mm -hmm. so um i absolutely think i have gotten pushed back again not to my face but i make it very clear as to where i stand um when it when it comes to what are we valuing in the classroom and if it's just you want to value the pain and suffering that you went through and you want to like give that to the next generation. I'm not down with that. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Ryan or Christian, do you have any uh, insight or experience in that? I love this question. Um, we, <laughs> Thank you. So I will just start with Monday. I participated in a optional, not required, um, eight hour long mental health training. Tuesday, I participated in our faculty conference where we talked about rigor and making sure that we do exactly what we just talked about not doing. Um, and so this reality that um, we're in an academic environment where institutionally we wanna make sure that we give the students what they're paying to be here for, um, potentially at the cost of their mental health. And so, um, it's it was an interesting two days and then going into Wednesday, which was, you know, business meetings and meeting with all the committees and doing all of our before the first day of the semester stuff. Um, it's been a very I so I did just see the question from Ashley about can I implement this by Monday if the semester starts next week? And the answer is yes. Um, I would say yes. I know my co-presenters might might have other other visions of that, but the the reality that we as professionals and as professors and educators have this option to give our students a really amazing educational experience that doesn't diminish their learning. And also, um, you know, one of the best things that was said at this, this presentation about rigor had to do with um, rigor is not related to the intrinsic motivation of our students. They might not, they might be motivated by grades, they might be motivated by their passion for a project, their passion for the work that they're doing. And so um, really just focusing on the fact that we want them to go through this awful experience that we might have gone through. Um, that's not going to create the sense of belonging that we're seeking. And so I think it's been interesting to hear even just, I have so many ideas just from the first however many minutes we've already been on here um, for my own ungrading process. But it's, it's interesting when you're thinking about how the students are engaging institutionally, what the requirements are of us as educators um, what the national discussion is, what the local discussion, right? All of these different things that are impacting how we approach our classroom. Um, and then ultimately, what do you decide to do as the educator in that classroom? That's awesome. Thank you, Ryan. And Christian. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, I think from, thankfully, like, as far as um, colleagues, um, they have questions and they might, not, they, they might go, ah, that doesn't make sense. I don't see how that works. Um, and that's totally fine. Thankfully, you know, I'm a part of a, a department that we all genuinely care about each other and want everyone to succeed. And that's just, we know that's going to look different for every one of us. And so, um, you know, I thought maybe I would get a little bit of pushback um, up the chain. Um, but actually, um, you know, this was, I when I gave the spec grading talk, trying to remember what year it was either 18 or 19 um and that was before going up for tenure and that was actually when I put that that content into my tenure packet um upper administration like when it went past our department those were the things that they had more questions about in a very positive way so thankfully um I haven't I really haven't received 
any kind of negative criticism or you can't do this because it's not the way we've always done it or any of that kind of stuff. Um, so I will, I'll give props to my school on, you know, being cool about that sort of thing. Um, I think in the department level too, I think my colleagues also know um, I'm not your typical um, academic person. Um, you know, I'm the, I'm the kid that cheated his way through high school, um, did the bare minimum in college because all I wanted to do was get out and get a job. And it wasn't until after that that I realized like, oh, I really like this design thing. And so then I went back to school and then realized that I actually really cared about mentorship and teaching. Um, and so then when I got into this position, I just I don't look like the rest of my peers. I don't sound like the rest of my peers and my students respond well to that. And so, again, that's kind of what everybody's saying. Like we care, I care about the students. I don't care what everybody else says. If they want to fire me. They can fire me or something. But um, I care about the kids. And um, thank you. Thankfully, we haven't I haven't had any kind of pushback or anything. But yeah, it's been pretty, pretty chill on, on my end. So then on the opposite side of the question, have you had any colleagues who have been converts? seeing what you're doing is like, oh, I want to do that, and then kind of established it in their own curriculum? Um, on, on my side, I've had, I have bought the book and given it to other colleagues, and they've read it. They haven't done anything with it yet. And then um, one of our art historians, he and I have, um, we teach like a summer class. Um, they're two different classes. We just, we pair them at the same time and then we make our students um, collaborate together. And so um, he did spec grading with um, that class because that's what I was doing as well. And he loved it. Um, and so he has implemented um, it in some of his classes and maybe even kind of tweaked it a little bit to make sense for, more for him. But yeah. Can I also um, add in, because I Please. saw a comment about like, you know, um, people worrying about sort of giving everybody A's. And I don't, I don't think that that's, I think that's a thing that is miscommunicated about, miscommunicated about with ungrading. I don't think we're advocating for everyone to get A's, but I think what I'm advocating for uh, has to do with the humanity of the student and them being more involved in the final evaluation process than what typically takes place and like i said I, I have a i have a pretty mixed range there are a's of course um but to me if a student gets an f in my class that is more of a reflection on my work as the instructor than it is on that student and i don't think that we are taught to think of it that way we're thought like we're taught to be like oh they just can't live up to the standard oh they're just not blah 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 and like if i ever give out an f it's because that student literally just did not show up to class did not turn any work that is the only reason that i think we should be having a student pay for a class and giving them an f not because we don't like their work because i feel like if you're a good instructor and you care about your student you will work with them to make sure that they get their work up to par and why wouldn't we want our students all getting b's and a's like, why is that not the goal to have every student succeed? And I feel like there's not, a, I, it's like I wanna write a paper now. There is a connection, I think, with this idea around not everyone can be successful and this idea of like white supremacy and like capitalism and like, you know, there is, like, there's only these elite people and then like everyone else, you know, we can't give everyone a hundred. There's something about that and I think I would really challenge us to think about that. Why don't we want our, all of our students to be successful? Why don't we want all students be making good grades in classes? Why do we feel like uh, a punitive measure is necessary for them to learn? Because I guarantee you they shut down. They don't believe that they are good at anything. They are so hard on themselves. And then like we've, we're still in a pandemic. I mean, there's, I don't, there's just so many other things to think about than like, let me punish this student. So I want us to like really think about um, the systems at play when we're thinking that everyone we you know it deserves a, like a failing grade and that's where they start. I don't I don't think that's where we should we should start. Yes, and the other thing I want to mention, very you know similar to this conversation, the the discussion that we were having on campus on Tuesday was very focused on we need to have a really challenging environment and grading and evaluation did come up right. What areas? are lots of students graduating? What areas are students dropping out and leaving the institution altogether? And so it, the ungrading or spec grading conversation always comes up in these areas. And um, 
campus wide, there's not many people at my institution that are currently doing it in all of their courses. Um, and then also departmentally, that challenge that you have, depending on the support or lack of support or understanding or lack of understanding, um, it's it can be really challenging for faculty that are fixed term and non tenure track and um, in the tenure review process to even implement this stuff because it's risky if your course evaluations are are off the chart. Um, and so I think there's a really big discussion that could happen, you know, even outside of our, our Zoom meeting today. But the reality that you may want to do this, but it is risky and it's something that um, I would argue it benefits the students and it allows them to come into the classroom where they're at and to be pushed and to work at, at their best capacity um, without some of the challenges of really formal um, criteria that's subjective and really just meant to kind of weed out whoever's the most creative and the least creative. I, I think also there's this there's this idea around design as being a place where you shouldn't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, yet we punish them with like a bad grade because they like messed up on a project. And so if that is the case, I feel like at least looking at some of the tactics that we do in this, in in ungrading can be helpful to like pushing them and empowering them to live in their mistakes. Um, because I would rather a student tell me um, I'm going to give myself a B on this project. And it's because I didn't get where, where I thought it was, but it's because I was trying all these other things. And if they can outline and have the self-awareness to tell me where they started, what they did, all those things, how is that not just as valuable as someone who like has this like golden, amazing piece of work, where it's like someone who's like, here's all the things that I tried. I really, you know, and, and you know, they're like four weeks, right? Four week projects, six week projects. It's not like a lot of time, but if they could like you know, notate, these are ways in which I tried to to do something different. Here's like some of my um, iterations. I, I would love to see that over like just a beautiful polished piece of work. I, I think it's a, we really have to value something other than the end goal, like the end outcome. I think there's something in the process that's being missed in the, in the value of what they're bringing to the table. And also, um, it, like the ungrading that I do, uh, it really brings in their own lived experience as a value and a valued contributor to their their outcome, like grading their outcome. And so like that gives an, another piece of like power back to the student. When I think about the unclassroom idea <laughs> that I've thrown out there, like, you know, valuing lived experience, understanding that I am not the only expert in the room. Like th those are all other concepts that get brought into the ungrading process. And so the person who asked, like, can I start this on Monday? My question would be, what other things are you doing in your class that also push against the academic system as an institution that can be harmful for our students? Because if you're only going to bring in ungrading, I would say that's that's going to look it's, it's going to be hip, like it's not going to work um, because you have to also be pushing yourself in these other areas um, of your policies and practices as well, which I don't think you can't not do. Like, I think you can do that by Monday, but like it really will take you sitting down like and actually thinking, why do I do some of the things that I do questioning um, those things before you start to implement them? Yeah, and I'll say with the, um, I step in like the first day of class when we're going over grading and all that kind of stuff, I tell my students, not from a, um, I want you to fail your project, but I tell them I want them to fail um, when it comes to a project. I want them to try so hard, so big, and then just, it, it messes up. And that's okay. I want you to play it. I want you to experiment. That's what I, I care most about. We'll eventually get to a good place, right? Um, but don't fear the play and the experimenting because we all know it's so important. But if I'm going to say that, then I have to give room in the deadlines to allow them to do that, right? So even though I might have, right, I kind of said in, you know, level D or, or unit one, there's level D and C are going to be doing on this date, right? And so they have until then to make sure that those criteria, right, like I said, they are executed exactly to what the criteria says, right? Well, how do they know if they're coming to me on the last day, did I do the thing right? Well, that's not enough time. So I put in deadlines beforehand to say, hey, this is this is when you need to turn it in. This is when we're gonna look at it, right? And I can let you know. 
and we can have that conversation. Did you do this exactly the way I asked? Right. And then there's that self awareness and all that kind of conversations that we start having. And then they go, no, it's not. And I go, okay, well, look, you still got time. You got a week, right. Or whatever it is now go back and like make those changes. And that's up to them if they want to go and spend the time to, to make those changes and get that grade or not. But I'm at least giving them the opportunity to play and the deadline isn't something that they're like afraid of, right? I don't. Ho hopefully that makes sense. Um, but. Thank you all. I think at this time we're going to uh, take some questions from the audience. Um, Lisa, I meant I, I saw that you said that we'd get back to one of the questions, but I don't know if you want to go ahead and and um, say those questions out loud for the for the uh, just like read those out and then we can answer them that way. Sure. And I mean, I also, we welcome people raising their hands and, you know, you can voice your questions as well. Um, I'm going to just scroll up in the chat, but I believe it was, um, shoot, sorry, here, I'm finding it. Uh, nope. I knew this was going to happen. The chat like was on fire. <laughs> um, but one person, and I will find that person's name, was asking um, Christian, the first question we got, um, if you could kind of give us a little bit more of a concrete example of the criteria that you might have for those different categories. I would say keep it really simple because I know we could probably get out into the weeds, but for an assignment or a project, right? Like what kinds of things are you including, right, as those criteria for the students to sort of lo be looking at? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of how to be able to communicate that easily. I, so maybe something I said, I can't, I'm going blank on the, this level of learning um, where like D is the lowest, A is the highest. Um, the, the D level things to me usually are like reading and writing and quizzes, right? You have read the thing and now you're regurgitating it, right? Um, that's like the lowest form of learning. Um, right. So the projects or things that are going to be in the level D should reflect that stuff. And that's why I say like usually level D's are more of that kind of stuff. And then in level C, it's going to be more of um, the project. Um, I'm trying to even see, you know, criteria. I'm looking at like a level C. This is like a self promo. I think this is probably coming from a professional practices class. Um, but like a criteria. Did you do research? and five mind maps? Did you make 50 completely different concept thumbnails? Did you further develop three of the 50, right? Like those are the kind of things for that level C. Um, yeah, I mean this, and this is, a, I mean, cause this is gonna look different in a lot of my, my classes depending on what class it is. Um, level B, they're starting to put together, it's like apply for internships, design studio visits, things like that. Um, I don't know if that helps answer the question. And so I will say, like, if anybody um, wants to contact me and like, I have no problem giving out like all of my um, units and all that kind of stuff to different classes on this stuff, because it's way more helpful. Um, that was what when I got introduced to the spec grading, um, that was what the, the presenter I got in touch with him and, and asked him like, hey, can I have your material? And he was cool and, and let me have it. Then I read the book and then I could kind of start to implement or decide how, what that meant to me and how I could put it into my classes. That's a lot easier because um, it really is a lot of information. Um, so anybody want to contact me and, and get that information, I don't have a problem um, sending that out. That's Thank really you, interesting. Happy. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say that question came from J.D. Ray or J. Dre. Um, but I was just going to say, I'm sorry to jump over you, Victor, that sounds very sort of like process based, right? So it's really about the students kind of engaging with their process in a specific way versus like, does your uh, website have a header, right? Or did you include this many images or something like that? Well, but it, it can be. And I think that's the, that's the thing I do like about, you know, the criteria really are up to me and, and kind of you know, based on the thing that the goal that I'm trying to get them to do and learn from that level, you know, it, it could be as simple as did you um, put a header, you know, um, you know, a lot of times there's there's one if they they've had to do branding for themselves and then they're making a website for themselves. Right. Does the I can put criteria when they're doing the website. Does it reflect 
your brand style guide that you created, right? And if it doesn't, okay, well then why? You know, like that's another question we have to ask and stuff, but it's that simple that it's like, did you do the thing? Um, and that it has to be really clear. Thank you. All I was going to say is that at the end, we'll go ahead and maybe ask you to put your contact information again, if people can contact you directly. Um, but thank uh, Lisa, is there a, a, a next question that we yeah. get So to? the next one down below, Patricia had asked, um, is this document um, contract, I think this is for you as well, Christian, is that like a rubric that you're kind of putting it together or it, do you, would you say it's sort of formatted in a different way? Um, I mean, it, it is a rubric. Um, I, I mean, it's a packet with all the information like i have a level b you know purpose task and then criteria and it's a yes no and then the question right and so i hand it to them and then that's their checklist and they can they always have it and they can you know okay i did the thing right and then i can circle yes right and then they bring that to me they show me their work and you know i can yes you did the thing um i think that answers the question Yeah, I think so. And then um, Teresa, uh, someone had asked if you would be willing to share um, the forms that you use, um, if you would be willing to share your grading form. And of course, you can decide if you would like to do that or not. Yeah, um, I will say, so now they're all integrated in, into uh, Canvas. So I don't have like a PDF that I that I give them. They're literally filling it out as part of the form that they fill out when they turn in their um, projects. Um, I will say it's, it is based on a rubric. So it's like, you have to figure out what are the, what's the purpose and objectives of that project that you're giving them. And here's what, here's what you, I would, I'm hoping that you learn. And then they are responding to that. And then once they respond to that, those, those items that you already have on your rubric, then that final question is like, so what grade do you think then reflects your contributions to these areas? So all I am is just asking a follow-up question, like after they've kind of graded themselves, looking at those areas that you've outlined in a regular rubric, then they say, then I just ask that question. What do you think then reflects what you've you know done to the class? And then please, it, it then you know be descriptive as to why, um, and that just opens the floodgates for them to to answer. So I mean, I don't necessarily know if it would help me to give you a, a sheet because it's so contextual based on the project that you're giving them. So, okay, perfect. That helps. Good. <laughs> And then there was another question from uh, Shannon, um, and it's possible that you've already kind of spoken about this, Teresa, but um, they ask, I think you said it best when you asked, what is the measurement of success? Uh, is the goal in the grades or is it in the student's own development? And it's possible Shannon was just sort of like re, uh, re-articulating yeah. the thing that you already said, but I don't know if you had any additional thoughts about that. Yeah. I mean, I think you got it then, right? Because it is in the student's success. Like that, that is the the point for me and why I like being an educator is the student's success. Um, so you've already got it. I think you, yeah. Okay. Now I think this is a real question. This is coming from Irma, uh, who says the, this conversation on valuing the growth and process is hitting the spot for them. I'm curious about how you're thinking about setting students um, into the real world, right? Local communities that are still stuck in this traditional um, excellence and hustle culture. So how do the three of you see this idea of kind of using these processes to then, um, and then how that might um, reflect on the students' experiences when they kind of get out, get out there into practice? I think it's it's a holistic approach then again. Um, so we had actually had a pre-conversation and kind of talked about um, having like an actual client that you're working with and like the client then chooses like the, their favorite piece of work, but it's actually like D-level work and we wouldn't have picked that. Um, and so um, I think again, like if you had that line of communication with the student, like to understand like, you know, you can have a, a client that they just, you know, they need something to pop, you know, whatever the heck they say, you know, we just, can you make it pop? Um, but you know, you have to be able to identify why it's good design. Um, and so I think that that if you have that open line of communication, you can easily work with that. But I think there just needs to be some foundational things set, right? Like, here's the actual objective. Here's still what I want you to do. Here's still what you're learning. Um, and, you know, here's what the real world is. But I think that there's things that you can do uh, and integrate into your classroom to emulate real world stuff. So one of the things that um, I have definitely changed is like my deadline policy. 
or like even when I have like homework stuff. So like when I was in, you know, uh, undergrad, you know, you could get the 50, the 50 thumbnails assigned to you, right? So I'll say that. I'll be like, hey, y'all, this is what I want next class. Now, you know, I'm, and I'm giving it to you on a Thursday. It's not due until Tuesday. You got four days. I was like, I want 50 thumbnails. Is that doable for y'all? And if the class overwhelmingly says, we have a project that's due on Tuesday at an, in another class, blah, 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 um, I will alter that deadline for them. And that emulates the real world because if you have a client and you are working with a client that you have a huge deadline due, you're going to pause your other projects. And I'm okay being on the back burner, you know, because we gonna get to my stuff, but it'll just might be a day later or whatever. And so there are other things I think we can do to emulate the culture that they will go into as a designer. But really that, that involves us creatively thinking about that in our classroom. I think, again, what we've been told is like the, the professor comes in, they spew at you stuff. You have to do what they say. You have to take every single piece of feedback that they say, or you're going to get an F. That is not the real world. Um, in the real world, I get to advocate for why my design is good and why I'm the expert to the client. And so how do you create that environment in the classroom with, with them essentially thinking of you as the client, the person who's saying, you know, with more expertise, right? But you know what I'm saying? We have to find ways of emulating that. And I think thinking about that holistically is going to be the approach that I would suggest that folks take. I have to chime in. So uh, there are so many things and I'm trying to follow the chat and I'm trying to listen and I'm trying to type notes and um, this is um, very fun. But one thing I wanted to mention real quick before it slips out of my mind, this concept of real world versus professional environment, they are different, but they are the same, right? So the reality that our students are living and caring for family members and commuting and not living on campus and coming in late, but still having an active brain to participate um, also, the reality that um, students can participate in a client setting as a team, students can participate in a client setting as an intern on a one on one basis. Um, at my institution, our internship supervisors, which would be the person working at that business or organization, they are responsible for evaluating the student. It is not a letter grade but it is just as comparable to how we evaluate our students. And so it's interesting to think about, right, the client perspective could be the polar opposite of our um, evaluation in an academic setting, but it's still valuable for the student to understand in this work environment, I accomplished A, B, and C. Um, with my faculty mentor, I wanted to accomplish X, Y, and Z, but I was unable to do that because this is what they needed that was more important and more timely. And so there are so many um, separate things that go into these decisions about how the students are evaluated, but I think the important thing is it has to go back to what they have learned and grown, right, as creatives and as future professionals, and I would even argue as professionals, as undergraduate and graduate students, because they do contribute um, in my institution to the clients that we work with. It's a really important um, contribution to the local community. And so, right, the grades and the assessment aside, it's there's still all of these other elements that are so important to their learning, to right, the institutional experience with the local community, the town and gown, there's, you know, a lot of things that go into all of those, those pieces. Yeah, and I'm, I'm trying to remember, because we did, we had a little conversation before this started. And so I'm, I'm trying to remember what, what, what I said, and which one, I don't know if we've communicated that we do give at the end of the semester, I think each of us gives a letter grade, we still have to do that for um, the university. Um, but the thing that like with mine with the SPAC grading, I give them a table at the very beginning of the semester that says, right, you're going to have three units. Um, and so if you make an A, an A, an A, you get an A, right? Um, and so on with all the different variables. Mm -hmm. And the thing I like about this is because in the middle of the semester, when a student has a life issue, which most of us do in a semester, even us, yeah, right? That means that I might, I might have to not do the project. And that's okay. And yes, there are still consequences to that. But for our students, for my students, they can go back to that table and they can go, okay, well, 
I know I can at least make a C on this project. I made an A on the first one. All I have to do is make an A on the next one and I can still get a good grade, right? And so again, it gives them that piece um, and, and teaching them, right? When they get out of college, you still have to take care of yourself. And I think that kind of goes back to that like hustle mentality and that stuff where we, our culture feels like we just have to go, 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 go. And if you have a mental breakdown or a health breakdown, sorry, like we'll hire somebody else, right? Yeah. And like, that's not cool. And we gotta, we gotta fix that. But like, it at least gives our students like um, what we should and how we should be taking care of ourselves. And that it's okay to say, I can't do this right now. Right. Let me take care of myself or my family. And then like, I'll do the thing. Still consequences, but those consequences don't have to like completely derail our goals. Right. Um, I think that's part of this as well. And I'm cognizant that we're getting close to the top of the hour. So I want to be thoughtful for everybody's time. But on that note, there was a question here. And so I'm so sorry for all the ones that are below that I haven't read yet. But Brockett had asked, um, uh, do you think that this is an efficient process or would you call this for the three of you an efficient process? Um, Brockett says, I'm concerned about the labor involved in grading and want to be honest about what I can and cannot do. And that was a question I kind of had too on the flip side. Um, how has this experience been for the three of you? If we're talking about mental health as academics, right? Um, how maybe have these processes shifted your own experience in the classroom that really you would say make it worth doing this work? So I would say um, for me, I started doing the the grade forms in 2017 and it's because I was looking for a way out of grading because it was so stressful for me. Um, and I will say it has been the best process because they get to look at them own selves. They, they kind of like tell on their own selves too. When I like think about things, I'm like, I think that this is not right. And then they will like tell on themselves and then I don't have to say it. It's like, oh, I don't have to say it. You said it. Great. At least, you know, da, 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 da. so I, I feel like for me, it has been one of the most relieving processes to have them grade themselves and say, okay, so that's where you think you're starting. Here's why I think it should be knocked down. Here's why I think it should be not, you know, not knocked up. And, and then it's, it's a great conversation that I get to have with the students. So it allows me to like, just be good at critiquing and not having to like say, here's how you should assign value to yourself in my class. Um, and I like that part of it. It makes me feel excited to, to look at their final work again. I just want to say hi, Brockett. Um, so yes, I have to agree. The, the reality that, you know, I made the decision summer of 2020 to start to investigate and implement for fall of 2020. Um, we were in person that semester. I know many institutions were not. So I took a huge risk um, that this could have epically failed. And the reality is, yes, it allows the students to have a conversation with their faculty, right? To, to talk and discuss where they're at, for us to be humans in the same space. And if emergencies come up, how do we allow flexibility? Um, how do we continue to really focus on their overall evaluation and their contributions but um so the other thing i did just remember christian when you said when you mentioned we had the conversation and did we say this here or there um we were also chatting about this concept of you know one through five or check check plus check minus and what you put into your rubric will really allow you flexibility that grading can become a much more enjoyable experience, unlike your taxes, Victor. Um, so I, I would argue, you know, if you look at rubrics or any of us share our rubrics or, or charts with you, um, think about in your setting, what will allow you to implement that based on what you're expected to teach and what you're expected to, um, you know, your institutional learning outcomes, right? How do all of the things at your institution allow you to then implement this to be a much more enjoyable experience evaluating your students. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll say, so because I don't implement spec grading into all of my classes, right, I get the, <laughs> the pleasure of um, doing both kind of 
traditional and spec grading at the same time. Um, and I, you know, the spec grading classes are graded, I mean, immediately, because again, the students are grading themselves as they're going. Um, whereas, right, I've, if life has happened and the consequences of my, you know, choices, it means that my like piles of projects have been backed up and now I've got to go in and I've got to spend hours on a Friday or a Saturday doing that stuff and then emotionally kind of thinking back and like where was the student at in this point right and I'm having to grade like it is way easier to do the spec grading but it does mean because of how clear things have to be from a criteria standpoint um, I do a significant amount of work especially if it's a new prep like if I haven't implemented spec grading into a class yet in the summer or the Christmas break right I'm having to do a ton of work to prepare all that stuff you know, like most systems, it takes a lot of time to set up the system. And then once the system gets going, right, then it just, it can keep, it, can, it takes care of itself. Um, so yes, like in the moment, spec grading, hands down, uh, like all day long, easy. Um, so much more helpful. Um, but but the, the other side, um, it just is a lot more stress for the students and for me. Um, and so I think that's what we're trying to kind of get away from for sure. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, we're at the hour, we're at 601 and in the interest of, uh, being respectful of everybody's time, I, uh, will go ahead and pause it there, pause the conversation. I say pause just in case we pick it back up in a future uh, virtual um, virtual event. But I do want to thank our three panelists, Teresa Moses, Ryan Coe, and Christian Dunn for being such uh, great panelists, great insight, and giving us a lot to think about. Um, um, there's a lot of things that you guys said that I'm hoping that to implement it, maybe not this semester, but in future semesters soon. Um, so we'll go ahead and stop the recording now, and I'll say some final final uh, announcements past the recording, but thank you. And